So uh, we are in Romans 7, so we're going to be picking up again. As Nathan finished 6 last time. And before I, uh, I want to, well, I want to pray first again. Lord, I just thank you for your word. It's rich, it's deep. Lord, I ask that you would just give me the ability to articulate your heart. Lord, that your word would stand as the truth of our lives. And Lord, we just give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. So, Romans chapter 7, this is actually a message that I didn't want to give. Um, And it's something that I also had to, to actually to check my own heart as to motives, as to why I am doing it. You know, is it something because of something that, that has happened here in the past that has, uh, uh, because of disappointments, because of a hurt, whatever. So, uh, I did a lot of praying about that. And I felt like definitely the Lord says, yes, you, you, know, you are to share this. Because in some ways, it'd be easier just to kind of let bygones be bygones and let things that have happened in the past. Because this is something that has affected this body a lot. We've lost probably four different families that left because of this issue. And it really came to a head for me probably about two or three weeks ago. I was listening to a podcast, and we have up here on, your, on the overhead, which I would highly uh, suggest that you guys would listen to sometime. If you just go to Naked Bible Podcast, and when you get there, it's, that is done by uh, Dr. Michael Heiser who is an Old Testament scholar, but he's one that is, uh, you know, sometimes you get these scholars and you, you try to listen to them and you listen and you go, what did he just say? But Michael Heisner is so good about, I mean, he knows like 12 ancient Semitic languages and he can take the old, you know, the Dead Sea Scrolls and interpret all that stuff. And yet he's able to communicate it clearly, you know, to, to lay people. And, and so, I, I, you know, you can actually go to that website, and he has like 400, I don't know how many, 480 different uh, podcasts, and each one's about an hour, like this one he did on Hebrews 8, is about probably an hour and 10 minutes, hour 15, something like that. And you can also get the transcript, so you can hit the transcript, and it'll give you the transcript if you prefer reading rather than, you know, rather than listening. But because he is an Old Testament scholar, it's interesting that he had a lot of the Hebrew roots people. Some of you are probably familiar with that. Some of you may not be. Uh, And what that basically is, is there's there's not a a central group. There's not a denomination. There's not a um, one group. In fact, some of them are at odds with with each other, but what they have in common is that they believe that you should be following the Torah, the Old Testament. You should be following, uh, celebrating the feast, seven different feasts. You should be following the dietary laws. You should be worshiping on Saturday and not in sun, not on Sunday. Um, and so that's one thing. Basically, they all have in common. And I was listening to this podcast, and as I was listening to it, it just brought up again something that that really put the fear of God into me, and that was the fact that how serious that deception is. And so I want to read a couple different paragraphs uh, that Michael Heisner gives in this teaching, just to kind of give you a little background where I'm coming from and, and how serious this issue is. In other words, it's not just like, well, this is my viewpoint and that's their viewpoint. 
uh, you know, we can have different views on eschatology, you know, when the rapture is going to come, on the millennium, or even Calvinism, or Arminianism, and, and the different divisions in the body of Christ, but they aren't salvation issues. And so, because he is an expert in the Old Testament, again, he has a lot of these Hebrew roots people would listen to him, at least up to this episode, which was episode 193. And he says the writer of Hebrews would ask his audience in several different ways, why would you go back to following the Torah? Now, the Torah is the first five books of the Bible, and that is where the regulations and the feast and dietary laws, all that stuff is within that. His concern is the Judaizers. Now, let me stop right there. Judaizers, just so you you're familiar with that term. That's, that's an issue that Paul dealt with throughout the New Testament, throughout his ministry. And who they were, they were Jewish believers who came to the saving knowledge of Jesus. But after they received Jesus, they began telling people that you need to follow the Old Testament. You need to follow the Torah. You need to, to begin worshiping on, on Saturday. You begin to follow the, the religious festivals you need to follow the dietary laws. You need to be circumcised. All these different things they were telling the Gentile Christians, you need to do this. And so Paul is constantly warring against this teaching. Well, the difference today is it's not Jewish people who are doing this. It's Gentiles who are trying to get other Gentiles to do that very same thing. Okay, I'm going to pick up his quote again. He says, He's concerned about the falling away, going back to the old system, going back to the works mentality. If you remember Hebrews 6, it's really a huge concern because he even says, for someone who was in that kind of system, and then they discovered salvation by faith, and then forsook salvation by faith in Christ to go back to works it's next to impossible for that person to ever come back to faith again. So this is a serious thing. And that particular scripture is Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4. And then as he begins to come to the end of his teaching, he kind of ends with a paragraph, and he says, We do not need to return to Torah. Christ is our Sabbath. Christ is superior to all things by divine design. Again, so I'm not misunderstood, if it helps you in your Christian life, if it helps you to walk with Jesus, who is superior to the Torah, if doing Torah things helps you depend on Jesus, sacrifice more, and if it just helps your thinking, good. But if you're trading the gospel in for Torah, you're in deep trouble. You need to stop and think about what you are doing because you are really in the crosshairs of the writer of Hebrews. Not only in this chapter, but pretty much everything has gone up to this point. So we need to take the, writing, the writer of Hebrews seriously and not fall back into these things. So I had, you know, people that I, I, I cared about that got into that deception. And, you know, it breaks my heart. And probably during that time period, of probably a year, over a year, my number one prayer was that Light would be shown. They would see that they would come back, that this wouldn't happen. There wouldn't be this division. But yet it happened. And after hearing this teaching, then it even, the seriousness of it really struck me. And so I would encourage all of you to, be, to continue to pray. Some of you know or are familiar with it. What happened? Some of you are not. That's all right. 
those who do, begin to pray about it. Pray that, you know, light would be shown into their life, that they could be a turning. And I would also encourage you to use this as a resource. That Naked Bible is a great resource to go back and get information. And, and he doesn't do just things on the Old Testament. He does, you know, like in this case, Hebrews. He does revelations, which might change your understanding of, of your thoughts about sometimes about end times, how it might come down. Uh, so just refer to that. It's a, it's a great resource. So that you can see, uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to go through quite a few scriptures here. So we're going to go ahead, go back to, to Romans chapter 7. And again, I just thought it was interesting that he had so many followers of his who were from this persuasion of the Hebrew Roots movement. And I got a feeling after that message, probably a lot less than what was there before. So... Romans chapter 7, start with verse 1. For you know, brothers, for I am speaking to men who know the law. Okay, so he's speaking to Jewish believers, very familiar with the Torah. Law, Torah could be used inter interchangeably. It means the same thing. That the law or, or Torah has authority over a man only as long as he lives. For example, by law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he is alive. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. So then, if she marries another man while her husband is still alive, she is called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of and is not an adulteress, even though she marries another man. So, my brothers, you also died to the law, or to the Torah, through the body of Christ, that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit to God. For when we were controlled by the sinful nature, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our bodies, so that we bore fruit for death. But now, by dying to what once bound us, which was the law, we have been released from the law, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit, and not in the old way of the written code. So to me, it seems like that, that's pretty obvious. And it's been a, a theme throughout the first six chapters of Romans. Again, going over this same thing about salvation by grace. Your works can add nothing to salvation. And I want to go through some other scriptures now. And we're going to kind of, because I want to see, want you to see it with your own eyes, through Scripture, as we, as we again go through the New Testament, different examples, and you're also going to see how this was one of Paul's main issues. He was always dealing with the Judaizers. There's always people who wanted you to go back under the law. So let's go to Galatians chapter 2. And we're going to look at verse 14 through 16. And in fact, I'm going to go back to 11 because I wanted to put it in context of what was going on. So Paul says, When Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he was clearly in the wrong. Before certain men from James... He used to eat with the Gentiles, but when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. So in other words, Peter 
was eating and, and not following kosher and, and living as a Gentile, we'll see in just a second. But then all of a sudden, these Jews who came from James, who were of the circumcision party, all of a sudden he changed. In verse 14, he says, When I saw they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of them all, You are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? So he addresses Peter to his face in front of everybody. What you're doing is wrong. And he was even influenced by it. We who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners know that a man is not justified by observing the law or the Torah, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the law. Because by observing the law, the Torah, no one will be justified. And it's, I would encourage you all to, to read all, actually all the way through Galatians because that's the main subject that he's dealing with in the book of Galatians. So in chapter 3, just drop down, first five verses, he says, and, and by the way, most of the, Gen, of the uh, Galatian church was, was Gentiles, okay? It says, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? He's really coming on strong against them. So he's, he's speaking to the church, church of Galatia. Who has bewitched you? How foolish. Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by observing the law or by observing or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish after beginning with the Spirit? Are you now trying to attain your goal by human effort? Have you suffered so much for nothing, if it really was for nothing? Does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you because you observe the law or because you believe in what you heard? So again, he's, he's in the face of the Galatians going, what has happened? You started off well, and now all of a sudden you have turned to legalism. If you drop down to verse 10 of that same chapter, it says, All who rely on observing the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of law. Clearly, no one is justified before God by the law, because the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, the man who does these things will live by them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. By becoming a curse for us, it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. He redeemed us in order that the blessings given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. So clearly no one is justified before God through the law. And turn over to chapter 5 of Galatians. Verse 1 says, It is for freedom that Christ has set you free. Stand firm then and do not let yourself be burdened again by a yoke 
of slavery. So he's calling the Old Testament, he's calling the, the Mosaic Covenant, he's calling the Torah, who people were trying to put these people back under. He says, it's a yoke of slavery. Mark my words. I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourself be circumcised, Christ will be of no value at all to you. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. That's serious. And when he's talking about circumcision, because one thing they will say, well, he's just talking about circumcision. No, circumcision was the outward sign of the rest of the law, of keeping the feast, observing the, the, the dietary laws, all the different things that went along with that. And so you can get a, a just turn over the next, we're just kind of working through the New Testament, but Ephesians, the next, very next book. Ephesians chapter 2. And verses 14 and 15. Talking about Christ, it says, For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one, and had destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing in his flesh the law or the Torah with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace, and into one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. So he's talking about Gentile and Jews becoming one. And how they become one? By abolishing in his flesh the law and its commandments and its regulations. Okay, so we have another two books to Colossians. And again, just giving you a sample through, through the New Testament, Colossians chapter 2, 14 through 17. I'll go back to 13. It says, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature... God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all of our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulation that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So he has canceled the written code with its regulations that stood against us. What he did on the cross, cancel that. Okay, let's go to Hebrews. And Hebrews chapter 8. And we don't know for sure who the writer of Hebrews is. I kind of lean towards Apollos, but we can't say for sure. But in Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 13, he says, By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete and aging will soon disappear. I think it's pretty clear. By calling this covenant new, the new covenant, he has made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete in aging will soon disappear. In 
in Hebrews chapter 9. Uh, let's look at verse 10. Because he's talking about throughout 9, he's given examples of the t- tabernacle, the worship that was going on. And he says in verse 10, it says, There are only matters of food and drink and various ceremony washings, external regula- regulations applying until the time of the new order, until the time of the new covenant. And verse 15, for this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. And one last one, chapter 10, Hebrews, verse 1 says, the law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. So all the things, all the uh, feasts, all the things they did in the tabernacle were all shadows of what was coming, which was the new covenant established by Jesus. So we have just a you know, a list of different scriptures we've kind of gone through. And, and again, it's, it's all throughout the New Testament. And you wouldn't think today, we'd think, well, you know, that was an issue that Paul dealt with back in the old, you know, in his day. We don't have that issue today. But we do have that issue today. It's alive and well, unfortunately, in our midst. There's a group here in Harrisonville, Overland Park, different places. We had a pastor here whose wife, in fact, got into the black Hebrews roots movement. So it's a very clear and present danger, and we need to be able to articulate because most of the people I find who actually get into this are zealous people. I mean, they're really people who really want to serve the Lord, but they get into deception. And it becomes about them and doing the things and doing the the works, you know, to to prove themselves. But I think what they end up finding is you're like a dog that's chasing your tail. You're never going to be good enough. You're never going to be able to fulfill it all. You're always going to be falling short. And you're going to be in a place of misery because you cannot get there. It's only by the blood of Jesus Christ that we stand where we stand. It's His sacrifice that puts us in that place where we can come say Abba Father and we must be aware of that that works mentality that can come in and that we need to add something and we need to do something and Christ said no I did it all for you and it's because of what you have done that I line up my life with what you what you would be pleasing to you not because I'm trying to earn anything. And so, again, that has been an issue that we have dealt with in this body. And it's something we need to to stay aware of and stay on guard. And you need to be able to defend what you believe. Because you could very well have people trying to draw you into that. And you need to know the answers and be able to stand on the Word of God. This is what the Word of God says, and go by that. Now, there's a ditch on both sides of the road. I'll always tell you guys that, that, you know, on the one, you know, on the the highway or the road of life, there's a ditch on both sides. There's a ditch on this side I just covered, let's say, regarding legalism that people get caught up in. But on the other side of the road, there is a ditch, which is called where people think like progressive Christianity. You know, I think Glenn just did a a woman's Bible study this last year about progressive Christianity, which tries to, to say, well, the word really didn't mean that. It really didn't happen. Come on, you know. And, And so it takes the word of God and tries to dilute it. And 
something else that just I just recently became aware of was something that's called manifesting. Another name for it would be the law of attraction. Now, what that actually, and it's influ, influ, infiltrating the church, both these things, progressive Christianity and this law of attraction. And what that is, it's that it says if you just focus enough, if you just meditate enough on your life and what you want your life to be, it will happen. And sometimes they even use the scripture, you know, as a man thinks, so he is, or words of our mouth, you know, speaking life or death, which is true. But they take these things and they begin to twist them and to say that you are in control of everything. And we should have good thoughts. But see, it's a whole different thing. It begins, it's a new age. I'm going to focus on what I think my life should be. And if I just focus enough and meditate enough, then it's going to happen. Like, I, I guess maybe God's obligated to do what you think you ought to do. But it's subtle things that come into the church that always sound good and that tickles our ears, but it's false. And again, so there's a ditch on both sides of the road. So we've got to keep on the highway. And if you notice what happens many times, if you actually look at accident reports, how often do you see where someone has got off the side of the road, got in a ditch, and then what happens? Overcorrect. You see it over and over. And they go on it, and they end up going in the ditch on the other side. It happens all the time, you know, in the natural. And sometimes it happens in the spiritual. I have seen people who were so legalistic that all of a sudden they got a little revelation, and they just they always went off the rail on the other side where, you know, it's like, it's like what Paul was saying, you know, because people kept accusing him of saying, well, if it's all about grace, then we just keep on, more, more we sin, the more grace. And he says, no, no, that is not what I'm saying. But yet already, before we got to uh, Romans chapter 7, he's already dealt with that twice. Because people were misconsuming his words and were using that. And so then you get people who do that. Well, I'm just going to live however I want to live. Heck, it's all right with God. So there is a ditch on both sides of the road. Okay, I guess I'll get back to Romans chapter 7. Yeah, I think that's right. <clears throat> to Romans 7. Now what I'm going to do in this last part, uh, I'm just going to read through it, for the sake of time, read through it, make a couple comments. Uh, I will say there is a little controversy. Different theologians think, okay, is this last part of Romans, is that, uh, Romans 7, is that Paul speaking about himself before his conversion or if it's after his conversion? And so there's a difference of opinion there, although most believe it's, it's actually after. Well, let's read through that. Start in verse 7. It says, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. Indeed, I would not have known what sin was except through the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, do not covet. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of covetous desire. For apart from the law, sin is dead. Once I was alive, apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life, and I died. I find that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. For sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, deceived me. And through the commandment, put me to death. So then, the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, righteous, and good. 
So did what is good then become death to me? By no means. But in order that sin might be reconciled as sin, it produced death in me through what was good, so that through the commandment, sin might become utterly sinful. Verse 14, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate to do, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree with the, with the law. I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. I know that nothing good lives in me, that in my sinful nature, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I can't carry it out. For what I do is not good, I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that is living within me. So I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For my inner beings, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of a law of sin at work within my members. Verse 24, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then I myself, in my, man, in my mind, am a slave to God's law, but in the sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. So a couple of things he says there. He says the law is spiritual. So I want you to think about it. The law was never given to make you holy, but to show you that you need a Savior. Where we get to the place, like Paul did, where he says, what a wretched man I am. That, that realization. And when we talk about the law being spiritual, it's not about the written code. Think about Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount. Because remember where he says, uh, you have heard it said, you shall not murder. But I say to you, whoever says roca against his brother is in danger of the hell's, of hell's fire. Or he says, you have heard it said that you shall not commit adultery. But I say, if you look upon a woman to lust for her, you've already committed adultery in your heart. So all of a sudden, he, he lifted it up. He's going, you know, it's not about a written code. It's about heart. It's about heart issues that goes much deeper than the code. And then there's that battle going on with each of us between the flesh and the spirit, between the old man and the new creation. And so there's, there's, a, there's a war that goes on. There's a fight. And as we engage in that fight, we stay faithful. We, we, over time, begin to walk in discipleship and sanctification. We begin to, it's a, prog it's a process. We don't all of a sudden wake up one day and all of a sudden have no issue. But we begin to grow in the things of the Lord. And we begin to stand strong. But there is that, that battle of the flesh. And the spirit. And a lot of that battle also is the battle of the mind. You know, the, the war that goes on in our mind. Because the enemy has, has ability to whisper things in your ears. To try to bring discouragement. To try to entice you in whatever way. And so we have to renew our minds again by the washing of your word. And stand strong when those things happen. When that word is whisper. You know, it's not even a sin 
unless you entertain it. So the enemy has an ability to put that thought there. But it's what do you do with that thought? And so there's that ongoing warfare within each one of us. Another thing is trying to live up to God's moral standard by our own strength and willpower without the Holy Spirit is a losing strategy. We have to have the Holy Spirit strengthening us, and it, it's His power. Because what we learn about ourselves is that the old man doesn't die easy. We've had a lot of, some of us have had a lot of years of, of giving in to the, the old man. And he doesn't want to die. But through the power of the Holy Spirit, leaning upon him and not your own flesh, we can get victory. Unfortunately, I'll have to leave you there, and then next week, or not next week, it's going to be several weeks later, but Nathan gets to come in and get chapter 8, verse 1, which is one of the great, great verses of the Bible. Well, I'll leave that for him. He can get all the glory, and I'll just do with all the, the, the negative bad stuff, you know. So. so anyway, I just want to encourage you guys today, again, just to stay standard to stay deep in the Word, to continue to study, to be able to articulate if you run into this, those situations, whether it's progressive Christianity, whether it's that New Age thing of, of uh, manifesting, or whether it's on the other side of the ditch about legalism, about following the Torah, how you can articulate, how you can stand, how you can have the Scriptures that you need to stand for truth. And do it in a loving way. You know, speak the truth, but speak it in love. So, Lord, we just thank you for your word. Lord, that you are faithful. And, Lord, I do pray for those. Lord, I'm thinking of even now, Lord, four families that left this, this fellowship, Lord, and have been caught in, in a deception. So, Lord, I ask that you would shine your light. Lord, that the truth of your word would come forth. Lord, you paid it all. You paid the price. So, Lord, I ask that you would break the power of deception in Jesus' name, that you would set captives free. Lord, that the glories of the new covenant would be seen clearly. And Lord, that they'd come running to you. So Lord, we thank you for your word. And Lord, I ask for your blessings and presence on this people. That as they go, Lord, throughout this week, Lord, just for your grace, the joy of the Lord to be their strength. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.